Thank you for joining us for the PebCAC Podcast, a weekly information security show featuring some all-around good people. It is week 40 of 2021. I'm Chris Louie, and with me, I have my co-host, Brian Deach. Hope it's cooling down for you out in Arizona. America is back, baby. These colors don't run. A runaway train cannot be stopped. I don't know what to even say anymore to open up these things, but you are right. It is cooling off in Arizona, thank the Lord. I think uh, the next seven days, we only have one triple digit day scheduled. And I think I woke up the other morning around five and it was actually 70 degrees. I didn't know what to do with myself. I was so giddy. Oh, well, that's cooling down for you. And we also have Glenn Medina, who has been crushing his Apple Watch fitness goals. Hey everyone, welcome back and thanks for joining us. Happy to be back for podcast number 27. That's 27. Unbelievable. Speaking of fitness, I'm only doing this to keep up with my two fellow podcasters here, and I have a goal to not look like a beach whale this year while on vacation. All right, I feel well, that pain. It's <laughs> definitely good to, good to set goals, and I hope you make it there. Thank you. This week, our guest is Paul Brettel. Welcome, Paul. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, yeah, Paul Brettel. Um, I work for uh, an organization that we're familiar with and been in the information security business for a number of years. I, pr- I keep saying this and it's a joke that is repeated often by myself. I probably should get a real job at some point because it doesn't feel like I do a proper job. Um, but yes, uh, been in information security now for probably 20 years. Well, great. Well, it's great to have you on, and thank you for joining. And on that note, combined, we have decades of information security experience and are here not just to educate, but to entertain. We've got four awesome stories for you this week, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. A bit of closing the loop from last week's episode. There have been five actors who played Jack Ryan, the protagonist from the Tom Clancy series of novels. So we have Harrison Ford, Alec Baldwin, which I forgot he was in Hunt for Red October, Uh, Ben Affleck, Chris Pine, who was in that awful spinoff reboot of the Jack Ryan series, and John Krasansky, who currently plays the Amazon Prime uh, Jack Ryan. There have been seven actors who played James Bond, so James Bond is slightly ahead. You didn't like the Chris Pine version? I I don't understand that. How could you not like that one? I didn't like the Chris Pine one. I I like that Keira Knightley was in it, but I didn't like the story or his, how he took the character. I, yeah, it wasn't for me. I think out of all those guys, I don't think I could pick him out of the lineup. Chris Pine? He's yeah. the Captain uh, Captain Kirk from the new Star Captain Trek. Kirk, yeah. 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 Nope, doesn't ring a bell. I think, like, I know that Jack Ryan is a, is generally characterized as a white, you know, actor. But if he was lined up with, like, seven other dudes and he was the only white person and everyone else is a different like Asians and we have a you know, Hispanic dude and we got a couple black guys there and three women. I would still be like, ah, I don't know. I don't know guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's a close one. All right. Well, we'll have to get you a, uh, we'll have to get you a photo of that. So you, you know who he is. No kidding. Paul, As someone from the UK who spent a significant amount of time there, then transplanted here to the US, what's one of the most non-political surprising things about America? Oh, I could talk about this stuff for a long time. Um, It's actually really interesting. And, uh, you know, the stereotypes of uh, British people about, you know, we're always in queues because they're officially called queues, not lines. Um, that we we always drink cups of tea and all that. A lot of that is broadly true. Um, but other stuff around things like um, uh, customer service, um, it, it is significantly different. You, you know, and I know a lot of Americans will complain, oh, customer service is worse now than it used to be 10 years ago and so on. Uh, no, no, from what I'm used to, it's way better than <laughs> some of the stuff that I, w- uh, I was used to from the UK. So... Uh, even if, uh, you know, your, your, uh, cell phone providers are giving a poorer and poorer service, it's still significantly better than what I was used to. So that's just one example. Uh, another one I tend to pick out as well. Uh, you know, again, people have this stereotypical image that, uh, the British are very polite and sincere and so on and so forth. Um, 
I know, and of course, people criticize Californian drivers. Oh, they're terrible. You know, the Californian cut where you cut across three lanes of the freeway to dart for the exit, all that kind of stuff. That's true. But I mean, seriously, if, if there's road works on the road and it, and it thins from maybe three lanes to two or, or two lanes to one in California, people will just zip merge and it will be rarely an issue. You do that in the UK, you are going to get abuse and you're going to get shouted at and everything. So it's kind of weird. So there are quite a lot of differences, but it's simple things like that, which again, Americans will often look at and go, oh, we're so rude and we're so terrible and the British are so polite and customer service is going down. Actually, no, no, you're actually very polite. You're very considerate. And while the driving standards could improve, you're actually very polite on the roads as well. So that's just a couple of examples. Okay. Well, that's very surprising. Thanks for letting us know and busting a couple of those myths. Hey, good day. if we ever go to London, guys, just Uber everywhere, because apparently it's going to be confrontational. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't get me started on the Uber drivers in London. <laughs> All right. On to our first topic. We haven't talked about any major ransomware attacks in quite a while since back since the uh, Kaseya hack because mostly the ransomware crews have been off to summer vacation at the Black Sea and spent some of their ill-gotten gains there. After Colonial Pipeline, the Irish Health System, JBS, and Kaseya, there was just way too much heat from law enforcement and they made the right move to lay low. Now, the first signs that we may be seeing a resurgent in ransomware attacks were actually caught by our very own Paul Bredel. Paul, can you walk us through the detective work you did and how your motorcycle led you to find out a major ransomware attack had occurred? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I I will then also mention, um, I, I know my, my phone is on silent and so on, but now is about the time when I get hassled by uh, Volkswagen Finance for my lack of payment uh, for my motorcycle. So it'd be kind of interesting if they actually do try phoning me while we're recording this in the first <laughs> place. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I bought a Ducati motorcycle. Not many people realize that Ducati is actually owned by Volkswagen Group these days. Uh, and I took out some finance on that. Uh, and I actually came to the end last payment. It's a balloon payment, but came to the last payment uh, at the start of September. So save my money up, make the payment, everything's done. I get the title as in any sort of motor vehicle finance. Um, I will admit that uh, it came to early September when the, the, the bill was due. I missed it by a couple of days. And so I actually was paying it through my wife's bank account and uh, yeah, just went through the system. You go to pay and it just kept coming back going, payment failed, payment failed. It's like, oh, this is really weird. Um, but we're a little bit concerned that the payment hadn't gone through. But then the phone call started uh, and I was getting three a day, every day from Volkswagen Finance. And then they kept coming. And I was kind of freaking out. My wife really freaked out at this point going, but we've sent the check. And I, you know, last time she looked online on a, on the app, the money had gone. It had been cashed. The money had been sent from Wells Fargo. And we could see that there was a stamp on the back of the check, obviously from you know payments received or something. And it said Volkswagen Finance on it. Um, but when it kept happening, and it was literally happening every day, three times a day, different person, it's like, ah, there's a breakdown of systems here. Some Something has gone wrong with how this works. And this is very, very odd. And I, I'm, I'm a big fan of... Um, Brian Krebs as a security reporter investigator. And I've been following a lot of what he's been doing for years now. And I just remember something on the back of my head when I last skimmed it. And it said something about a company called TTEC um, and a uh, call center company, massive ransomware, blah, 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 early, early stage in investigation. And it just registered in the back of my mind. I went, call center. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, TTEC is the organization that runs the call center internationally for Volkswagen Group. Uh, so it's like, oh, oh, that's interesting. So they are impacted. But when we think about you know, motor vehicle finance, um, you've got to think about that, that that's linked to uh, you know the financial system and payments processing. Then that's also then linked to, uh, from a, a title point of view. They don't, so there are all these vast number of connected applications and systems. And clearly something is stopping 
all of these working and communicating together. So as a customer services group, TTEC just can't do anything, but they're still running the call handling process. So they still have these queued up calls. And actually, you know, slight update from when we talked about this before. I had another call uh, yesterday from somebody and I asked him straight and I said, do you work for TTEC? And he mumbled and, and I mean, I, I, it's Volkswagen. I said, no, do you work for TTEC? Can't confirm or said, deny yes. that. <laughs> oh, he actually yeah, confirmed he, it. He, he confirmed it. Nice. And I said, I'm, I'm aware of what's actually happened. How bad is it? And he said, it's really bad. Ooh. I can't do anything. I'm so sorry. Um, I, yeah, I'm so sorry we've, you've been treated this way. Um, but yeah, he did confirm it. He did He did absolutely say that they have a problem and none of the systems will communicate together at the moment. So there's this poor employees are kind of stuck in this constant cycle of just irate and annoyed customers um, that they've just got to sit through. We're also humans and we tend to forget stuff you know, as far as most people, they go, oh, Colonial Pipeline. Oh, that was weeks ago. Oh, that, you know, it's all gone and it's it's sorted. But actually, it's important. And and in the case of the TTEC stuff, you know, clearly what's happened is something has occurred. This is a dramatic impact. And we talk about, you know, impacts to organizations and, and whatever from a ransomware point of view. The issue here is, is that it's a third party that's affecting the reputation of a international, I think it, it, it's between Volkswagen and Toyota, the two largest vehicle manufacturers in the world. Volkswagen does not have a great reputation in North America from some of their behavior in the previous years. This has a potential of annoying existing customers significantly, and it wasn't their fault. So the point where, and, and, and I'm genuinely, I, I, hopefully going to get my title and I would like to upgrade it and I would like to buy a new motorcycle. I am genuinely considering not buying a Ducati again due to this, this, this result of this behavior. I potentially could end up with a hit on my credit rating for something I didn't do and I actually did correctly, but because it's automated and the issue from a consumer point of view is I've, I personally, I have then got to go back to those credit agencies to fight to have this resolved for something I didn't do. Yeah, well, I hope you get your title and your $15 back because this is not expedited service at all. <laughs> but no. Yeah. So as Paul mentioned, T-Tech, they, they handle customer service calls for like Bank of America, Best Buy, Credit Karma, Dish Network, Kaiser Permanente. Um, and, and the like. And based on the evidence that's been leaked so far, it does point to the Ragnar Locker ransomware gang. And as a result, wait for it, you're going to experience longer than expected wait times. Rim shot, please. They, uh, T-Tech, they rely on thousands of call center employees who work from home or work from anywhere, and they were unable to log into their systems remotely do the ransomware attack. And, and like Paul said, they they rely on some of these automated systems that just fail because they, the servers aren't up and they'll either have to switch to manual control. Like we saw with, with the Norse Hydro, they just switched everything to manual or they just got to wait it out until they, they restore their systems. It makes you almost think and wonder if this was more than just a ransomware attack. And was there any data exfiltration, right, Chris? I mean, I mean, if we went back a couple episodes, we talked about a host gets hacked. You had an issue with Best Buy, right? Yeah, yeah. Best Buy and T-Mobile and yeah, you you name it. So yeah, it, it, this would be a treasure trove of information if they did get data out. When you think of all the customer contacts, all the details from all these international companies, if, if that gets leaked, you know, that might be worth more than, than the ransom they're asking. So the uh, the moral of the story, right? Hopefully you guys can all see this as clear as day to me. Use your wife's checking account to pay your motorcycle bills, man. What a power move. Like seriously, <laughs> be a man. That is amazing. But joking aside, right? Uh, when you first said, you're like, I don't know if I'll buy another Volkswagen product. I was like, eh, that's kind of uh, extreme. But like, yeah, but I guess I'm with you. Like, if it's D in my credit, I'd be pissed too. So I get where you're yeah, going it. No, I know, and and you're right. I, I should should I should I take such a dramatic view? But it, this is a good example from a business point of view that that they could do something. They could. I mean, whatever happens, it's a massive in, impact. And you know, Volkswagen Group as an organization is one that's going to take the take the fall for this. I would imagine. Um, 
you, you know, do they do they just not process things? Do they not take payments? Do they not send out? Uh, do they do they pay out? <laughs> do they pay out fines? I, I I don't know. But as a business, there's something they could do as a as a provider of stuff as a, a to consumers. They could do stuff uh, to not make this painful. Um, but equally, I'm fully aware this is a giant corporation that relies on money. So let's be honest, we know what they're probably going to do. Um, and that is a realization that. As a consumer, I'm not that important, so maybe I shop somewhere else. Yeah, vote with your dollars, vote with your feet. It's like I'll I'll, mm. I'll buy from the company that doesn't have their customer service get breached. Exactly, exactly. But you know, it is. It, it's again like I I was thinking about this last night about this interconnected network applications and systems. I we can only imagine what their systems are they'll have the vast amount of these connected systems any single part of those breaks or is interrupted and the whole thing breaks and, and, and we we tend to forget that applications and services are a vastly interconnected set of things so from a ransomware attacker do they do they take over the entire network and applications and servers nope don't need to just need to break that critical link and everything falls apart all right. Well, we definitely hope uh, this wraps up for you soon so you can upgrade your, your motorcycle. Um, on to our, our next topic. Uh, we're going to talk about trust someone security as opposed to trust no one security. It turns out a new phishing campaign used a cross-site scripting attack against UPS.com's website to distribute, distribute malware. UPS.com is the popular global shipping and logistics company and is one of the brands most impersonated in phishing attacks. The phishing lure typically states that the reader has an unclaimed package or a shipment got lost and they have to click a link or download a file for more information. Well, it turns out UPS's website, UPS.com, contained a cross-site scripting vulnerability where an attacker could generate a document download link where it would appear to legitimately come from UPS.com but download the content from a remote server controlled by the attacker. This is particularly concerning for two reasons. The first is that we, as security practitioners, have trained our users not to click on any links they do not expect, especially links that are not from reputable companies. Generating a spoofed email from an at ups.com domain and a link to a ups.com website appears more legitimate than a link to I steal your password.com, so users are more likely to click on it. The second reason is that due to resource constraints, many so-called security solutions out there may automatically bypass websites they deem trustworthy or reputable, such as ups.com. If the content appears to be downloaded from a ups.com domain, it may not get scanned by a security product which exercises a trust someone methodology. So what the hell is up with like cross site I'm sorry cross site scripting vulnerabilities it's been around for like 20 years you would think like secure coding practices right would prevent something like that or a third party technology scraping the site and, and looking for these vulnerabilities i can't believe that ups fell victim to that it's only on the oas top 10 <laughs> yeah it's for how many years in a row there. right yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like, don't they front end their servers with some type of web application protection? You would hope so. I mean, at this point, you got to think that they, they purposely put it there. I don't know what you think. <laughs> like, you'd have to actually go out of your way to be that, that dumb. Sorry, UPS. I love you guys. Don't lose my package. I, I can comment one of their competitors does use quite a lot of web application firewalls <laughs> for that exact reason. So I'm I'm a little bit surprised I, why they don't do that as well. I have to go back through my text messages, but I, I purge them every two weeks automatically. But uh, I had seen a couple of UPS ones come in, like the uh, SMS text message, like, hey, click here for your shipment. I'm like, slow your roll. I'm not clicking on nothing. But I'd be kind of curious to throw that at, like in the burp suite and see if it was trying to do something, you know, creative. Something nefarious. Yeah, throw it in a sandbox. Yeah. And speaking of tech, speaking of text messages, uh, is anybody getting the AT and T ones at the moment? Oh yeah. Okay, that's the that's the current campaign. All right, fair enough. Not just me. Maybe T Tech is uh, AT and T as well for customer service. I, Who knows? 
I haven't, I haven't gotten that one. I, I, I have friends pinging me, letting me know that they got, are you, you guys, are you guys at t subscribers? I am, yes. Okay, because yeah, I, well. I, I think, because I think you can take so. a, you can take a phone number, look it up, see who the carrier is, and then it might be a little bit more targeted, because uh, I've, I haven't gotten any at t spam, I haven't gotten any T-Mobile spam, actually, um, other than, you know, them legitimately notifying me about the breach, but I don't. I don't know if T-Mobile does a better job filtering that or if their T-Mobile is, you know, the number three carrier and they just don't care about us because we're so small and I think AT&T is the, the number one carrier here in the I U.S. Think, I think T-Mobile has other issues right now, so. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, the, the, the AT&T ones are kind of interesting. Um, I've actually, I've kept a couple. Uh, they've changed their strategy slightly. I'm just looking at one now. Uh, free message, apologies for coverage downtime coverage spelt incorrectly obviously uh it, it click here for compensation <laughs> so you, you know it's it's the classic one and the other one was uh thank you for being a, a yeah thank you for being a great customer click here for you know a reward oh there we go there's another one yeah absolutely that's not a, bit, that's it, not a bitly, uh no it's not okay no no okay yeah for those of you who can't yeah. see me holding on my phone <laughs> i'm showing a uh, at&t free message sorry for the signal down on September 12th. Here's a symbolic reimbursement. What does that mean? <laughs> they do know my name, though. That's impressive. They call, actually it, call me Brian. What's even more odd uh, is, like, even what Paul was saying, that they, they spelled uh, coverage cor- incorrectly. Like, how do you... Yep. Is that okay? People will actually fall for the fact that people sp- misspell things in a message to them. Like, that's an automatic... That's fake. I, d- yeah, and... Don't worry, they got my name wrong as well. <laughs> Fun. Yeah, that's, that's always the huge... Well, at least that's what we train people. It's as if there's spelling errors, grammatical errors. It's but, obviously... you know, but you know who would click on that? It's my dad. <laughs> then he would it's tell true. me, hey, like... by the way, I clicked on this and nothing happened. And then I'm like, well, yeah, oh, today. Plenty <laughs> happened. <laughs> plenty Trust happened. Me, plenty happened. I'm going to try to fish him. <laughs> well, I, I will admit, I did actually uh, through a secure browser just to see what was behind it on on one of them. Anyway, it's a uh, here have free AirPods. Uh, click here, fill out your details. Oh, and by the way, all we want is shipping. Um, now, chances are it probably is real behind that because I think it was like ten dollars shipping, but the product won't be real. So you're you're probably paying ten dollars for a uh, knockoff pair of headphones that are probably you could buy bulk for two dollars. So they are delivering something, but it's not what you wanted, and you're still being ripped off. Yeah, and then they'll steal your credit card data and sell it to somebody a month or two later. All right, our next topic was a thought provoking exercise from Brian. How long until botnets are used to influence YouTube videos, Twitter posts, or is it already happening? Brian, why don't you walk us through this one? Well, if you think about it, right, like the botnets nowadays are used to carry out attacks, DDoS. Uh, maybe they're doing some type of crypto mining. Uh, maybe they're, you know, harvesting accounts and all that good stuff. But like, I guess my my, my thought on here is like, you know, how 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 long until the botnets get sophisticated enough that they can evade like the Google recaptcha, right? And start influencing videos. Like I, I, I'm pretty confident that I could probably write something to like maybe a man, the browser to almost do like a account takeover, right? Like, Hey, I'm just going to go to, you know, Brian Deach's YouTube channel and I'm going to subscribe to that. And if I do that like 11 million times, right, then all of a sudden I have a, a lot of power and influence. Or I guess the, the the real question is, or is this just something that's actually already going on? Like, is it QAnon? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I think that it would be worth it. I think, uh, you know, if you have a video that's getting lots of views and you have a lot of subscribers, I think you could probably monetize that. I mean, Paul, you, you have a small foothold into YouTube, right? And uh, I think you only get like five or 6,000 subscribers. I mean, what would happen if one day you woke up and you had 11 million over the course of like <laughs> seven months, right? And you're contributing content on there and it's getting likes and comments. And I mean, you can script all that and you can you can make these, these botnets behave like human beings. 
you can completely yeah, especially randomize. the power of AI. Yeah. You just run an AI server from Azure or AWS, and you can create like coherent comments to try to avoid the the bot detection. Exactly. It, it, I, it's actually really interesting. I, I I've I've dug in on this one in the past actually because. Um, I, I'm increasingly, it's a bit sad. I, I, I probably should stop watching YouTube, but there are a few, uh, you know, long form videos that talk about some of this subject. You know, the, the algorithm itself can be manipulated. Um, the, you know, getting around some of the copy protection stuff again, it's pretty well documented. But you're right. Yes, there is a financial incentive to do this because the algorithm is around, uh, it changed a few years ago, it's around uh, interaction. You know, it, it, you, it's not necessarily about the views. You can get millions of views, but if you don't interact, you don't get promoted. And if you don't get promoted, you don't then get further revenue from the, the ads. You, ha you have to have ads served on a YouTube video to make revenue. If you don't get that, you get nothing. Um, so uh, there was, and I, I don't quite remember the details on this one, but there is a there was a couple of instances where the systems have you know, people claim breached and so on, but I think it's just a vulnerability within the process where, where somebody will get a comment going, uh, subscribe to me and I'll subscribe back uh, or words to that effect. I won't use the exact ones because don't, whatever you do, find these messages because it will actually do it. But yes, uh, it, it, there is a method that somebody's used where they would publish some random video, probably ripped off, and then they would just go through and send a message or comment a message on videos and then as soon as you clicked on that message not a link but a message <clears throat> it redirected you to their their particular videos uh, and then as soon as you subscribe to them then they started to get multiple additional subscriptions to their channels as well as view watches as well which then boosted up the revenue so you know rumors are that some of these individuals made considerable amount of money in ad revenue from google through literally just somebody subscribing and not actually watching the video so it is there it does work and it has worked before now what's the actual details behind it youtube is really shady around letting people know how this worked or how it worked um and then that's before we even get to the whole takeover of channels it's like sort of the, there, there like is an the entire industry google algorithm google doesn't tell you how their google algorithm works because as soon as someone learns it someone's going to game the system to to mop it up like we have clues of how it works because we have a whole business around seo search engine optimization but they'll never disclose the the algorithm mm, no e exactly yeah don't hate the player hate the game so but like what if you use these powers to like hey like you're just a you know an upcoming artist right and you want your music video of some album or some song you made right you just say like you know for 15 bucks i can do this and get like 11 million views uh you know 3 million subscribers and you know 10,000 comments right all over the course of you know 90 days like i think that that could be so useful in a in Is a it? very very bad way is um, that how this kid from uh, Canada got his start? <laughs> <laughs> he was discovered by Usher. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, but also think like how powerful, like if you wanted to get type, some type of messaging um, onto Twitter, right? And you just, if you can get something trending, then all of a sudden, like, I think it just catches fire because there'll be some type of engage, like, and that's the thing, right? You can pay for subscribers on stuff and the, the usernames and stuff they have you know they they follow ninety five thousand people they have three followers and there is actually no content to it but if I have a bot that goes out there and does exactly what you need like subscribe and comment right I think that's it that would be very very hard to detect and they say not, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd so all you have to do is just get that first crowd started and then everyone comes in and say hey what what's going on here what's going on here and then then that that attracts you know an even bigger crowd so i think it, it, it sort of has that snowballing effect you got to get your start somewhere and then it'll snowball out of control but how do you get that first start yeah i i've 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 dug in on this one a little bit on youtube and there are 
the, the a lot of it is not AI driven. A lot of it is a, a, a you know an organizational driven thing. So yeah, you can you know, like you say you can pay for the subscribers and so on. You can also start now. You can pay for comments, um, but you literally have a, an army of people behind this that are going in and and, and making random comments. Um, that has got more sophisticated in that they now start to look at the titles, uh, and and it's it's all API driven. You know they 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 pull the APIs from the YouTube platform what's the title of the video and then they literally click a button to paste something that's equivalent to the actual title of the video or a great music video or or, or great review or something like that so they're starting to make this uh, relevant to the video so because obviously google they're kind of experts around a lot of this machine learning and so on they, they they can purge a lot of this automatically identify it but by using people to do this with an automated way um, they're getting around some of this, but you're right. The idea of using something like, uh, you know, machine learning and AI to drive this in an automated way, it's all APIs at the end of the day. It's so easy and it won't be long before we start seeing so, it occur so, if it hasn't already. So this is typically for monetary gain. Would you, would you guys agree? Or is this yeah. just yep. for notoriety, right? But if you look yeah, at things like influence campaigns too, yeah, if you yeah, want so to sway someone to like a deep fake or something and convince yeah, people it's real. That's exactly what I was thinking, Chris. So if you look at the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, right, they were swaying people by votes based off of what was being automated or posted inside Facebook, right? So just another way, just another way to sway people's persuasions. So, so I mean, obviously, Google is doing things like correlation, right? Like the, the IP addresses and stuff. And there, there's some red flags there. But again, I think if you have a big enough botnet, you can sway that. And then you can use, you know, automation tools not even interacting with the API. I'm talking like uh, Phantom JS, right? Where I can come in and I can I can make it look like the key, uh, you know, keystrokes are actually going in. It's not a copy and paste. There's some backspace. There's a pause in it. I can manipulate uh, mouse clicks. I can manipulate mouse movement. I think it'd be really hard to fingerprint that if done so correctly. Think, if, yeah, we need to put our podcast up for that first then. So we need some upvotes. <laughs> <laughs> leave five star reviews let's go that's it we continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week dad joke of the week this week our guest paul is up british humor let's go let's go paul <laughs> okay uh how many programmers does it take to change a light bulb how many how many not even one because it's a hardware problem <laughs> that's a good one. Wah, wah, wah. That's wah, a good one. Wah, wah. Yeah, that, that's not British. That's actually, a, that's, that's a pretty good. It's a good, it's a good tech joke. I thought you'd like it. We did. Thank you, Paul. All right, to wrap things up, customer service company T Tech is experiencing longer than expected wait times due to a ransomware attack. You cannot trust a file download just be because it came from a reputable website such as ups.com. Botnets will soon be, if not already, used in influence campaigns. That's all we have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find us all on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at PebCAC Podcast. You can help us grow the podcast by telling someone else about it. And we want to thank all our listeners and subscribers who have rated us five stars in the iTunes store and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow the show. The best way to find us is to search for the PepCAC podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. For my co-hosts, Brian Deach and Glenn Medina, and our guest today, Paul Bredel, I'm Chris Lloyd. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next week. And as always, have a nice day. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.